Okay. So happy to have, have everyone on board. We were just waiting, giving everybody a few minutes to join us. But I think we have 100 plus on thus far. So I think it's, now is a good time to start off. So welcome again. I'm Nichelle, your host. And this is the third and final of our strategy series uh, leading up to the 2022 Annual Caribbean Summit. I know you guys would have seen a lot coming to you depending on where you hang out, if it's on LinkedIn or Instagram, or if you, you know, follow any media locally or in the region. And for those international ones, but I'm sure you would have gotten a lot of stuff coming out from BSI if you follow on their end. And we'll talk a little bit more about that after this presentation, but we'd like to jump in ASAP. So today we're going to get an overview of the balance scorecard. Um, and get a, you know, the basic, a basic understanding of that whole concept and methodology. But we'll also dive a little bit more into the nine step framework created by the Balance Scorecard Institute and Howard Rum. So I'll hand you over now to Terry Sterling, who is with the Balance Scorecard Institute. He is the training director, expert facilitator, senior consultant, long list. So Terry. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we're glad to have all of you here with us today. Uh, just a little bit of information about me to get us started here. Uh, I have been with the Balanced Scorecard Institute since about 2010, currently the director of training and also one of our senior consultants. Uh, my experience with the Balanced Scorecard really started back in about 2000 when I facilitated through a, a government agency with about 3,200 employees. Uh, since that time, uh, I've worked with the scorecard a lot. Uh, I've worked in all different sectors. Uh, and currently, I sit on a board for the MUMA College of Business uh, for U University of South Florida uh, under Customer Experience Certification Program. And I also serve as chairman of a large uh, nonprofit board here in Florida. Uh, today's thing, uh, we're going to be basically be talking about the Balanced Scorecard Essentials course. Uh, this is designed to give you just an overview of that course, and we'll touch on some of the concepts in it. Uh, but the, the basic thing we want to do is talk about, one, what, what is a balanced scorecard and how is it used? Uh, we'll give you a, a, a quick introduction to our nine-step process called the Nine Steps to Success. Uh, we'll talk about two or three different strategy tools that you'll be introduced to in the course. And, and then we're going to talk a little bit about who the course is actually designed for and uh, why you might want to consider sending uh, certain people from your organization to it. So with that, let's go ahead and dive in. Please, if you have any questions anytime, just let uh, you can send them in the chat and Michelle will keep track of them and, and we can go from there. All right, so let's talk about the purpose uh, of the Essentials course. The Essentials course is basically, it's an interactive experience and we designed it to help people get a basic understanding of the scorecard without actually becoming experts. Uh, we, we try to set this team up so that if you have people who will be assisting in the process of implementing your balanced scorecard, but not necessarily driving it, maybe they're on a theme team or objective owners team or something like that. This is a one day course or two session if you do it online uh, to where they can actually get some background in it so that they have a little bit of context uh, when it comes to participating in the formulation of their scorecard for your organization. Uh, the basic outline for the course looks something like this. Uh, we start out with giving a balanced scorecard overview. Uh, we talk about balanced scorecard systems in general, some of the history behind them. Uh, then we get into some concepts of performance measurement and key performance indicators. Uh, we spend time going through the nine steps in the balanced scorecard framework that we developed. Uh, and then we jump right in and we give you some practical experience and some strategy formulation. We talk about mission, vision, core values, strategy profiles, uh, SWOT analysis, PESTEL analysis, steeples. Uh, all of this stuff is, is all covered in the strategy formulation part. And we cap that part off with an application exercise uh, where we actually have you develop some objectives and a, stra and a strategy map to get some practice at using that visual tool. Uh, we then jump into performance measures and strategic initiatives. 
Uh, there we uh, have you form a couple of metrics based on the outcomes that you are looking for from your objectives. Uh, and we talk about your initiatives and how to do some prioritization with that. So we'll introduce you to a couple schemes there. And then from there, we move to strategic alignment. Uh, how do you get everybody in your organization on board? Uh, there's also an exercise for that. So where we actually have you take the strategy and take it down one level into your organization. Uh, again, to see what that looks like and kind of get a, a basic understanding of what that feels like. And then the last part is basically we talk about the execution. We talk about rolling out the scorecard. We talk about conducting performance analysis uh, and evaluation. So that's basically what the course covers. It's a single day. It's a lot to get in. It is filled with uh, a lot of information, a lot of activities. It moves very quick. Uh, and uh, the people that have gone through this course have all thoroughly enjoyed it because it's given them a really good background for what they were planning on doing. It's also a good way to get an overview if you just want an introduction to the balance scorecard to see what it's all about. So let's talk just a little bit about what is a balance scorecard. Uh, we like to say it's a strategic management system. And what it does is it communicates what the organization is trying to do. It communicates what the organization sees as its future. And it does it to both internally to its employees, and it also does it to the stakeholders outside the organization. Uh, it helps us align our work. It makes us more efficient in our organization because everybody starts to understand how what they do on a daily basis actually contributes uh, to achieving the organizational strategy. Uh, and when everybody is aligned, uh, organizations tend to be able to do things faster, quicker, uh, sometimes cheaper, uh, and able to accomplish this without really sacrificing quality. So that's the thing we're looking at here. How can we get more efficient? Uh, a part of efficiency is, is our prioritization management of our initiatives. Uh, we talk uh, quite a bit about this. Uh, one of the things we've seen in a lot of organizations when we go in is they're trying to do too much too fast. And so we talk a little bit about prioritizing these initiatives, uh, maybe some portfolio management, uh, and, and to keep in mind, what is your organizational capacity when you're doing this? Uh, do you have the capacity to actually pull all of this off and do it all at the same time? And then finally, uh, we talk about metrics. Uh, and metrics are basically how well are we doing? Uh, it's, it's a scorecard that tells us how we're doing as an organization. Are we moving forward? Uh, are we just kind of in a, a status quo mode or are we actually having issues? Uh, the metrics point out, you know, the things that are working really well in the organization, as far as well as those things that uh, maybe aren't working so well. And it gives us a reason to go investigate to either replicate the good stuff or to improve the areas that we're finding problems in. So when we look at a strategic management system, we basically are looking at something that's con sort of connecting the dots or uh, it's connecting the strategy with operations. That's really what we're trying to do. So when we look at the high level strategy elements, those are the things like your mission, your vision, your core values, uh, any SWOT analysis you might do, uh, customer value propositions, anything in that realm that actually uh, will contribute to your strategy and everything that comes to mind is scenario planning. Uh, that's another important part that we would uh, address in this area here. From there, once we've developed our basic strategy, we've come up with our strategic themes, which are our three or four main focus areas that we're focused on as an organization. We then can go into our objective development and our strategy maps. Uh, and our methodology of strategic objectives are basically, what are those things that we have to do on a continuing base, basis in order to achieve our strategy? Uh, we call them continuous improvement uh, verbs and uh, actions. They're things that, show continuous improvement when we would look at them it's not status quo we wouldn't see objectives that just kind of indicate we're just happy where we are we're always moving towards that uh objective of continually improving what we're doing as an organization the strategy maps are simply a visual uh, that we use to tell the story of our organization strategy uh, basically most people are visual and if I hand you a strategic plan that's an inch thick and it's all typewritten with no illustrations at all, no graphs, no charts, no nothing, most of us probably won't read that. 
But if I can present my strategy in such a way to where it's attractive, there are images, there are graphs, there are things that I find interesting and visually appealing to me, I'm probably going to pay more attention to that and probably actually be able to recall a little bit more. So strategy maps are, are one of the visuals that we use when we're doing this. When we get into measures and targets, simply measures are just used to track organizational performance. And we have all sorts of different uh, families of measures. Uh, most of the ones that we're concerned with when we're building the scorecard are strategic measures, uh, but we also have taken consideration there are risk measures, there's operational measures and, and, and many others that all play into what we're trying to accomplish at the end of the day. The targets uh, simply can be defined as that's our desired level of performance. What is it that's acceptable and what is that we're really striving for? Uh, and those we talk about setting and, and some of the things that you need to consider when you're doing the target setting. They shouldn't obviously not be just set in a vacuum or, or just set to motivate people. You have to do a lot of research, thinking, and discussions before you actually get a good set of targets. And then finally, the strategic initiatives. This is where the rubber meets the road. How do we accomplish our strategy? Uh, how do we make? How do we operationalize our strategy so that we're actually able to go forward and do what it is that we're trying to do as an organization? When we look at the uh, nine steps to success methodology that we use when we do the balance scorecard, uh, it's represented by this wheel graphic here. And if you look at the center of that graphic, you'll see the mission and vision is core to everything we do. Uh, and then you'll see surrounded in the mission and vision, we're looking at things from four different perspectives. Uh, we're looking at from a financial stewardship perspective, a customer stakeholders perspective, an organizational capacity and internal process. And then we have each of our nine steps as we go out. Notice between steps six and seven, we have this thing called system rollout. Uh, that's where you've actually completed uh, your, your first six steps. The plan is ready to be rolled out to your organization. Step seven, eight, and nine come after it. This next graphic will be a little bit clearer, so we'll spend a little more time on it, just actually going through and, and showing you some of this. All right, so we start out any engagement by looking and interviewing executives. Uh, we look through any information we can find on the organization, uh, reviewing what they've currently done in past strategic plans. Uh, anything that's going to show us that might be of value that we might want to know before we actually start the work. And this is true whether or not you're using somebody from the outside, a consultant, or if you're doing it internally for yourself. You still need to do the planning. You need to study uh, what the organization's done in the past because there's probably a lot of good stuff that was done uh, that you can possibly migrate over into your new system as you're doing that. The first step is the assessment. And this is where, again, we start out usually with doing a SWOT analysis. Uh, we do an organizational assessment. We do a gap analysis where we look at uh, all of the different components that we typically see in a scorecard. Uh, and we see if, one, if the organization's done them, and two, if, if they're acceptable, or if maybe we'd recommend that additional work be done, or at least they be revisited. And uh, based on that assessment, we then either create or we validate the strategic elements uh, again, beginning with mission and vision, and then we go through the core values. Uh, we start looking at customer needs, uh, customer profiles, and, and strategy profiles based on customers. Uh, a lot of work goes into this step because it's really important to get the assessment phase right before you move into anything else. From there, we develop our strategy. Uh, we decide, okay, what are the basic themes that we're going to do? What are the three or four main focus areas uh, from a global perspective that the organization needs to be focused on as we do this. Once we're able to achieve those themes, then we start developing objectives. Typically, the way this works is if there's, say, there's three themes, uh, there'll be three teams of individuals that are usually from a cross-section of your organization. Each of those will be assigned a separate theme, and each one will develop objectives on how to accomplish the theme uh, the way they know what they're doing is for each theme, there's a strategic result. The strategic result basically tells us what success looks like uh, when that theme is accomplished. So the, each of these theme teams will build objectives. Uh, they'll then go ahead and go into a mapping process and develop theme maps. At that point, it's all passed back up, usually to the senior management team or executive management team. They take all of the work that's been done uh, by other folks in the organization 
they compile it and come up with a single strategy map for what we call a tier one or the organizational wide strategy. Uh, again, the strategy map is, is more for visual reference, uh, but it's a way to tell the story of your organization's strategy to, to almost anybody you meet and to do so in an interesting way to where they actually bring uh, the, the observer into the conversation. Uh, from there, we start working on measures and targets. Uh, here, we're concerned with strategic measures. We're not really concerned with operational at this point. Uh, what we do is on the objectives. For each objective, there's one to three intended results, which are another word for outcomes, what we're trying to accomplish with those objectives. Uh, so we base the KPIs that we're building on those intended results. By doing this, uh, we're ensuring that we're measuring the right things because the objectives are a direct result of the strategy and the assessment phase that we did and everything ties back to the mission and vision. So this is the one of the ways that we, we start making sure that our metrics are actually uh, some of the ones that are actually going to give us the ability to start making some uh, data dri driven decision makings as we go through this. From here, it's about the strategic initiatives. Uh, we usually have the organizations furnish us with a list of all the ongoing initiatives. Uh, we add to that list any initiatives that were uh, suggested as we went through the first five steps of the process. Uh, we then go through a prioritization scheme uh, that usually involves several steps uh, to get this down to maybe the top 10 or 15 initiatives for the organization. Uh, and then determine how many we can actually do out of that top 10. Uh, and, and then we start doing the scope on them to where we're going down and asking the deeper questions, looking at budgets, looking at organizational risk, building a business case and so on. Just trying to get everything so that we're, we're ensuring that we're doing the right things to move the organization in the direction that we want it to go. After you get this part done, it's actually time to roll the system out. Uh, and that's a whole process in and of itself. Uh, it's about getting communication plan, taking into consideration all your different groups that you're going to be communicating with, what the message is to each group. Uh, at this point, you also want to make sure that uh, your budget folks are aware of the strategic plan and, and probably what some of the costs are that you're looking at in regard to initiatives and, and just the administration of the plan. And from that point, you actually begin your strategy implementation. Uh, the time frame for something like this for most organizations uh, to get from program launch to the rollout somewhere between eight and 12 weeks. Uh, after this, you then go into your performance analysis. Uh, it, here is just about analyzing the data, collecting the data, uh, and putting it in a form so that people who maybe don't have analytical backgrounds can understand it and it makes sense and they can use it uh, in their daily decisions as they're driving a the strategy. The next part is about alignment. Uh, this is about going down one level from your organization into maybe your departments or, or bureaus or whatever it is that you might call the next uh, layer down. And it's about getting each of those to look at that tier one map and, and figure out which objectives on that they directly have an impact upon pulling those over and then building the rest of their strategy around that. By doing that, it actually in, ensures that we actually are getting some alignment through the organization. Uh, and then they actually have to go through the process of developing metrics at that level as well and any in, initiatives that might be on a department level. Uh, finally, the last step is evaluation. Uh, we always wanna be in evaluation mode uh, we don't necessarily want to wait till the end of a year and say, okay, let's, let's see what's working, what's not working. Uh, we generally recommend you some type of software so that you can monitor it on a continuing basis. And when you see something needs adjusted, you do it at that time. Uh, you don't wait for a year. Uh, if you see something that's broken, fix it and, and make the changes. One thing we say about the scorecard is it's never in stone. Uh, it's a living document, it's fluid process. Anytime you need to make a change, if it's going to, uh, if it's believed it's going to impact the organization in a positive way, you make the change. Uh, so it, it's it's never static. It's always something we're looking at. We're always looking at continuous improvement. So why would we want to integrate strategic planning and performance management with a balanced scorecard? The first reason is it aligns the organization, and that's really important so that everybody understands what it is that they're doing and how that applies. The second thing, and to me, this is really huge, is about communication. 
Uh, every organization that I've worked with, including my own, is when we saw the Malice Scorecard implement and when we saw people really serious about doing the right things, communication got better. Uh, start breaking down some of those walls that sometimes are present in some organizations, silos, and people actually started talking and working together and figuring things out. So it, it cut back on things where people are working on the same project in two or three different divisions and, and aren't even aware of it. So it, 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 you gain some efficiencies from it. Uh, and you also find out that there's some other people in your organization that are pretty smart that could probably help you in, in different things that you're doing. It helps leaders uh, because now they have the information. If they're trying to get the organization to a higher level of performance, uh, they're equipped and, and people are motivated and all of this is working together in their favor. It does provide a discipline framework. It's, it's very uh, flexible. Uh, there's a lot of things to fit into this framework. It's not just rigid. Uh, it's very adaptable to other things like Agile. It's adapted to uh, OKRs. Anything like this that you'd want to involve into it, Six Sigma, all of these can be adapted into the framework. So it's a very flexible framework. Uh, and it's worked pretty well in just about every sector that we've we've, we've been in. Uh, again, we're looking at improving performance through measurement. Uh, it's not about, you know, just collecting measures to measures. It's actually collecting things that actually mean something so we can make solid decisions based on sound information. Uh, and again, that leads us to the informed decision making. And finally, it contributes to organizational growth and it minimizes expenses because everybody's pretty much on the same page now. Once it's done, it's just a matter of people doing what their assigned duties are to keep the scorecard working, evaluating it, and, and moving it forward as you get a chance to. When we get in a lot of organizations, when we first go in, we'll interview the senior execs uh, or the C-suite when we're in there. And what we find out is this is kind of a graph where we find them lots of times. They're not always on the same page. Uh, they're close in a lot of instances, but sometimes there's a little bit of misunderstanding or, or maybe they're not all in agreement on all of their goals. And what we really try to do in the scorecard process is we want to get everybody on the same page so that everybody's going the same direction and they understand exactly what it is that we're trying to accomplish. The one of the ways we do this is through alignment. When we align, it's basically just going down to different levels in the organization. In the scorecard methodology, we refer to three tiers. Tier one would be organization wide. That would be at the global uh, level of the organization. Your tier two might be departments, it might be business units, support units, bureaus, whatever it is that you call them. And then from tier three is, is strictly pretty much individuals, maybe some small teams, but generally when we talk about tier three, we're talking about individual performance. So you might have a, a organization that has several layers of tier two, and that's okay. You might call them a tier two A, a tier two B, tier two C, whatever you want to do there. But everything between the employee and the top of the organization is a tier two. And what we end up doing is we end up taking some of those uh, objectives up here from the tier one map. We figure out what we support down here in our unit. And then when I get to the individual, notice there's no mapping. Here I'm just looking at what my department is doing, what I respond to. I look at my job responsibilities and I come up with two or three objectives that will help me get better in my job that will support our strategy in, in our department. Uh, this is done sometimes on a quarterly basis, sometimes a semi-annual basis, but at least annually. Uh, we generally recommend it be done at least on a quarterly basis. It keeps employees engaged, it keeps supervisors engaged with your employees, and it moves the entire organization forward a little bit. When we talk about remembering how a scorecard process works, we usually use this uh, metaphor here to where we say that the, the whole process somewhat is a little bit like building a house. Uh, it starts with the foundation. You have to have a strong foundation here. The uh, leadership has to be engaged. Uh, you've got to have good communications. They've got to be interactive. They've got to be clear, uh, transparent. And then we look at the core values. What are the ethics of the organization? What's the expected behavior? If all of those are solid, then we can start building on them. And when we're looking at the, the themes here, these are basically the pillars that hold up the walls. 
These are the three or four main focus areas that the organization is focused on. It's things like operational excellence, strategic part, manuring service excellence, and so on. These hold up the roof structure, uh, which is all your high strategic elements, your mission, your vision, your core values, your uh, customer value propositions, uh, your SWOT analysis, your scenario planning, all of that stuff in that area goes to there. And then we talk about the perspectives. In the balanced scorecard, we look at four different perspectives. Each of the perspectives would represent a different floor in the house because each one is a different perspective on how we look at things. Uh, when Kaplan and Norton originally started out with the scorecard, they were looking at a balanced set of metrics across an organization as opposed to the traditional financial measures that a lot of organizations tended to use. They said it's deeper than that. We actually need to look at it from these four different perspectives. Uh, and then those four perspectives were maintained as they actually expanded this to include strategy and, and got it out of the, the metric realm to where it wasn't just about measures. It was about managing an organization effectively and developing a strategy to do that with. The next few slides are just two or three. I'm going to show you a few quick tools, and we're just going to go through them briefly. Uh, we spent a little bit more time in the class talking about them. Uh, this one here is just a one-page uh, strategic plan. If you look at it, it's got your mission, it's got your vision, it's got your three themes, and your strategic resolve for each theme. Uh, down here in the bottom left, we have a strategy map, so we have our strategy laid out. And then we have the metrics we're looking at, we have the targets for each metric, and what are the top initiatives that we're looking at as well. And then down here, uh, you've got your core values. This includes everything pretty much that you need to do to brief anybody on your strategy. Uh, you, can, you can brief uh, for five minutes, 10 minutes, or half hour. Uh, but it requires you to understand explicitly what is involved in your strategy and to understand what's behind each objective, behind the metrics and things like this. But it's just a, a great one pager to have in your back pocket that if you find yourself out in a meeting, you need to talk about something, it's, it's very nice to have this available. Uh, strategy maps themselves are uh, a great visual. Uh, this one here is just a basic one. Uh, we do demonstrate in some of our other classes, some of the different variations on this. Uh, some organizations get very creative uh, but basically, you're looking at how you drive value from your organizational capacity level of your organization up through your processes and then into uh, your finances and your stakeholder. Uh, the two things that might change here is if you notice these top two perspectives. Uh, this one is set up right now for a mission-driven organization or a government. If this was a for-profit organization, Finance would be up here on top and your stakeholder, customer, constituent, or whatever would be down here in this level. So those two would switch places. Other than that, uh, this is the general order that we normally find these in. One of the other things we use, and this is a great tool for driving conversations, is a strategy profile. Uh, what we look at is we look at value uh, factors or market differentiators. In this specific case, uh, this is one that's based on Southwest Airlines. Uh, back when they were uh, starting to compete with other airlines. Here, uh, what they're looking at is what's the emphasis uh, that we're going to put on something compared to maybe our competitors. Uh, you can use this for this type of a purpose. You can use it for to look at your customers, uh, to say how our customers currently see us and how we think they should see us, and, and define these gaps that exist between each one, and, and maybe find out the areas that you need to put more investment in. Uh, maybe we're going to divest in these areas because we don't feel that we even want to consider them like the other airlines. We want to be different. So in this case, they said we've got to get more effort at being friendly and we got to be tops at turnaround time. So all this is for is for here is for driving conversation. And again, it goes back to the reference I made that uh, the majority of people are visual learners. And if you have some type of visual up when you're having these type of discussions, it usually makes them a little bit more meaningful and interesting and people usually stay more involved and can retain uh, ideals just a little bit better. The other thing we talk about in the class is, is when we do our KPIs, we use models uh, to develop KPIs. Uh, they're based on the 
uh, outcomes of the objectives or the intended results. And we typically teach three different models to develop these. We use a logic model. Uh, we use the uh, Ishikawa or fishbone diagram. And then we use a process flow uh, diagram analysis to break out these intended results and then just get an idea for more metrics. That's usually the beginning step uh, when we're picking metrics and then we go into a, a selection process after that. Again, these are just a, a brief introduction for you today, but just to show you some of the things we talk about. Now, that's kind of just a quick overview of the course, uh, but really who, who should attend this course? And again, I, I kind of alluded to this in the first slide. This is based up, if you have people that are going to be on the theme teams, uh, the objective owner teams, the, uh, the measurement teams, this is a good course for all of them to get a good contextual background of what's going to go on in the process. Uh, it can save some time when you actually go through the process because they've had a little bit of training ahead. It's also good for anybody who any business professional that just wants to get uh, a little bit more abreast of what's going on in the planning world. Uh, the scorecard's been around. Uh, this birth was in the early 90s. It's evolved a lot since then. Uh, but we're still seeing a lot of organizations uh, from around the world that are, are using this and are very interested in it. So we're looking at managers, planners, analysts, supervisors, theme team members, objective owners, majors, maybe even see uh, C-suite folks if they're just trying to get a general feel for what the scorecard is about. Uh, that's pretty much it on the essentials thing. Other courses that we offer, we offer associate certifications. Uh, and the balance scorecard and key performance indicators. We offer professional certifications in the balance scorecard, key, profess, key performance indicators, and objectives and key results. And then we also offer a master professional certification. In addition to training, we obviously do some consulting. Uh, we do executive team training. Uh, we work with SMOs and PMOs for establishment and improvement. Uh, strategy execution process improvement and a lot of other different things. So. Uh, hopefully that's giving you a little bit of information about what the essentials course is about. And at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Nichelle and we'll see if we have some questions that need to be answered. Nichelle. I'm here, Terry. I haven't left you. I'm here, Terry. I haven't left you. Okay. So we have a bunch of questions. Thank you so much for that, Terry. Um, and let me just get right into that. So the first one is from Mugash. I'm seeing how many performance measures do you recommend for an organization in BSC? I kind of left them for you. Yeah, when you're looking at a, stra a strategic level in an organization, uh, somewhere between 30 and 45 measures is usually manageable. Uh, if you get too many more than that top number, more than 45, it, it starts to become a little bit large and uh, I'm not sure that it's really going to be a return on investment because you're probably going to end up getting more people involved and you might just not be getting the information back. But we found historically that if you've got 30 to 40 measures at a strategic level, you're in pretty good shape. And Mugash, this, um, these measures would be aligned to your objectives and your objectives at a corporate level or strategic level would be like about 12 to 15. And I'm only sticking that in because I know some persons use objectives to mean measures and vice versa and all of that. Yeah, so just in case. Uh, we The next one we have is from Laura. Okay, Laura York about the slide deck being available. I think I answered that in the chat. You can check that out. We will circulate over the next couple of days. It's being recorded. Next one is from Angela. How do you suggest to guide a strategic planning process while the next year uh, presidential elections are, are expected? which would lead to major political, economical changes. Yeah, that, that's always a consideration uh, because you can control your uh, strategy somewhat internal. Uh, but one of the reasons uh, that we suggest doing a Pestel or steeple analysis uh, is because that forces us to look at the macro environment. It forces us to look at the political aspects of what we're doing, the social aspects, the technological, the environmental, the economical the legal and the ethical, all those things are considered in those. Uh, so I would probably plan to do what I could internally. That's what I can control. Uh, but you just have to monitor what's going on outside the organization. 
uh, especially those things that might impact what it is you're trying to accomplish. Okay, so Martin asks about the extent of the interaction regarding the acquainting with the scorecard. So I'll follow up with him, he asked the email. So send that. Next question from Robert. I teach at a college and discuss balance scorecard in light of why we use accounting related metrics to perform performance evaluation. Are there any short case studies that are available from the Institute that I might be able to use in a classroom setting? Sorry, but I have to find free resources due to budgets and trying to keep costs down for students. Thank you from Robert. <laughs> Robert, we understand that everybody needs to keep costs down, especially right now. Uh, what I'd recommend is if you go to our website uh, and look for blogs and white papers, you might find some information there that uh, might direct you. Uh, I can also, I'll, I'll hang on to the chat here and I'll, I'll see what I can find. I'll talk to our CEO as well. And we'll see if we have anything that can, can help you in that area. Yeah, sure. Robert, you can always send me an email. I think you'll get it at the end. Uh, Davis, how to measure and develop metrics to some objectives that don't have clear ways to put numbers to report on? Yeah, when you're actually uh, looking at objectives, not all of your measures will be something you're already measuring. So sometimes you have to look at, at uh, one, you have to look at the availability of the data. Uh, are you currently collecting data that you can use? Maybe uh, you can't do a direct measurement. Maybe you have to build an index or or, or maybe you're using correlation or contribution to get to one of your measures. Uh, but sometimes we're not really sure how to really measure something. Uh, so I'd like to tell you that there's a precise way of doing it all the time, but sometimes it's trial and error. Uh, we get what we think will tell us what's going to help us move uh, the needle, so to speak. Uh, but maybe after a couple of months, we find out that that data really isn't telling us what we thought it would. Uh, so we have to regroup, revisit, and at that point, go in and actually start uh, looking at some other metrics. The modeling techniques we do usually help us quite a bit with this because we break down each of the results that we're trying to do into components. And usually with that, uh, we usually end up with more measures than what we can use. Uh, so out of that, we're, we have a laundry list to pick from. Uh, we can generally come up with some pretty good measures on stuff. Uh, some stuff is just really hard to measure. Uh, and uh, one that we see a lot of times is quality of life. And that's just a perception measure. And honestly, that's that's usually the result of a survey or, or something that's sent out to you know, internally within your organization, a climate survey, or maybe something sent out to uh, some of your customers and stakeholders, different things like that. But that is something that is you have to constantly look at simply because you develop a set of metrics doesn't mean you're done. Typically, you've got to look at that, revise it and shake it out and figure out which ones are really, really working for you. Uh, and generally, within a year or two, your metrics will get pretty strong if, if you go through that process. Okay. So next up is how do you marry BSC approach with OKRs and strategy implementation? Okay. Uh, just so everybody knows what we're talking about. O OKRs are objectives and key results. Uh, we actually offer a course in that that actually explains in detail how that occurs. Uh, but typically where we would implement those uh, is generally down uh, at the employee level. Uh, they align real nicely with the um, the scorecard. You can do it at the tier two level too. Uh, the biggest thing that we run into conflict sometimes is under agile methods. Lots of times uh, that was developed pretty much for software implementation. It's been adopted <laughs> in the business world, uh, but to do it without any type of strategy is kind of haphazard. And you might have a lot of people accomplishing a lot, but they might not be accomplishing the right thing. So uh, OKRs just naturally fit in uh, to a, the balance scorecard real nice, uh, especially when we get down to that tier three. Yep, and you're actually coming up with your KPIs. Uh, will you please reflect a little more on data dictionary from Aperba? Okay. Uh, 
when we talk, and I'm not really sure what your question is, there's specific. You mentioned the data dictionary. It's all there in there. Uh, Probably not. I don't recall. I don't think so. I, when I talk about data, uh, there's a couple of things that come to mind. I hope this answers it. Uh, when you have people dealing with data, uh, one of the latest things I just read is, is somewhat alarming. Uh, we have a new classification uh, that's come about in the last few years of, of, of jobs of, called data scientists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The problem is a lot of data scientists aren't doing what they're getting paid to do. Uh, they spend 90% of their time cleaning data and another 9% doing administration, about 1% what you hired them for. So uh when you're dealing with data you gotta have people know what they're doing uh you've got to do your best to make sure that your processes and procedures are done in such a way that you have clean data in there uh as far as the dictionary part I, i'm not really sure what you're getting there uh we do talk sometimes about for an organization with a balanced scorecard you need to have a strategy glossary everybody needs to know what you're talking about so you need to have those terms in the same words so that everybody understands what what you're talking about at the end of the day Okay, next question. Thank you for this presentation. Have you found that in recent years, especially post-COVID, there's more emphasis on value-driven results and impact? The landscape changes have prompted more agile approaches to KPIs, both on an organizational, personal, slash team member level. And I think you touched a little bit on that, Terry, when you were speaking about the OPRs, but maybe you can cover that. I think... Since uh, COVID, I think everybody's looking at different things right now. I, th I think you have to. Uh, the world today is different than it was three years ago. Uh, organizations are having to deal with uh, hybrid work schedules. You know, how do you manage those? How do you manage teams when you're working in that, that type of environment? Uh, I, I think in, organizations need to investigate uh, all the tools that are out there and find out the ones that are going to work best for their culture and stuff. Uh, the balance scorecard to me is, uh, it's one that I've used, uh, before I even got into this role with the Institute. Uh, and I've seen it being very effective and it's, it's been very flexible and, uh, it pretty much met all the criteria we were looking for. So, uh, that would kind of be my response to that. Okay. And now you're planning also have according to that yeah, in response to that question. Okay. We go to your next question. Should we consider intangibles? If yes, how do we measure them from Dr. Alfred Quintano? Uh, yeah, intangibles are something you're going to consider. Um, it really depends on on the strategy that you developed uh as far as which ones you would measure uh it, i know this is just kind of a general question but yeah we're going to look at them in every organization with every organization is different so there's there's not a a pat answer i can give you for that it really depends on the organization the sector saying what it's trying to accomplish is, and everything that's been done but we're, we're definitely going to look at intangibles as well as others okay on the definition of BSC, can you clarify on the communication elements after scorecards are developed? We are just developing scorecards right now. I need to be well conversant on the definition. Let me see that slide again. Yeah. Well, yeah. When we're dealing with communication, uh, we usually have a communication workshop where we actually talk about, uh, we identify, you know, who are the different groups we need to communicate with? Uh, what's the messaging that needs to go to each group? Uh, whose voice should the message be in? Uh, who who should it be delivered from? What types of medium or media we're we going to use to to get the message out? Uh, what are the risks? Uh, what are the costs? All these different things that you have to look into to to come up with a communication plan. Uh, but the basic things to me, the things that are really important, is to know uh, who you're going to deliver the message to. Uh, what the message is to each group, realizing that the message can't be the same for all groups. It's got to change based on who it is that you're trying to communicate it to, and then how you're going to get the information to them, and how are you going to know if you're successful or not. Okay. 
from Adam for organizations with a longer span of control. Example, what is the best approach in cascading the enterprise-wise forecast to divisions and departments? So how do we cascade from tier one to two, then three? Yeah, uh, when you get the, the large organizations, um, and again, it depends on how they're structured, uh, you have some conglomerates that the, the tier two organizations uh, they're owned by the the tier one, but they really don't do anything that's similar to what the tier one does. In that case, we'll treat them like a tier one themselves. We'll treat the tier two like a tier one. Uh, and we usually don't recommend you go down much below one or two levels in your organization. Uh, we've, we've got a couple clients that have wanted us to go down three or four deep, and we actually resisted a little bit because we didn't feel that the return on investment might be quite there for them. Uh, but again, it depends on each organization and what you, and, and what you do with them. And the organization I worked in when I drove this down, we actually drove it down uh, three levels deep and, and into the uh, tier three level after that. And I think we've even introduced like a tier zero for if we had like a group office or something and then go to tier one at a division level. Yeah. All right. Next question. All right, where can we find cost dates, et cetera? So that's coming up next, Lauren. So hold on for that. Um, how does the balance scorecard methodology compare to the lean methodology of strategy deployment by Hoshin Curry? That's from Patrick Powers. Yeah, that one's going to be, that can be a long discussion, but uh, it, it does fit in well. I, I'll just say some of the aspects and some of the things are very similar. Uh, especially when you get into the internal process perspective where you're looking at different processes and stuff like that than a lot of the, the methodology that you're used to in your, your lean, uh, the six segment stuff like that does come into play. Uh, we also do stuff like process maps and things like this, uh, uh, depending on the organization and, and what their needs are. Okay. So I think that covers everyone. Did I? Miss anyone? I'm just double checking. Everybody's saying that's a presentation, very insightful. Um, yeah. I think we covered everyone. Yeah, at 119. All right. So let me just share screen here quickly for those who are still with us. And for those of you who had questions about the summit. Terry, can you see screen? Yes. yes. Okay, great. So thank you again so very much, Terry. Thank you, Candice, for championing the marketing and the coordination of these webinars. If you guys missed it, we had two others, uh, one on monitoring um, and the management of your strategy. If you missed it, well, check out the recordings. You can always send us an email. We'll send it over to you. Thank you to our BD officers, Sweden and Sasha. We thank all. I think we had like 200 plus attendees this, this time, hailing from Trinidad, the wider Caribbean, and uh, even international attendees hailing from various parts of the globe. So happy to have you all. It's not a Caribbean thing per se, even though we branded it as such. Happy to have you. So I'm Michelle Grandison. I'm the founder and the chief strategy officer at Strategy Plus Consulting. Strategy Plus Consulting is the authorized global partner for the Caribbean region. And uh, we have decided to put on the summit and these webinars are attached to that. So let's hear how you can uh, attend. This particular webinar was special in that it gave you the overview of our second event, which is Balance Forecast Essentials. So we were happy to have Terry on board to give clarity for those who are still trying to make up their minds, still not sure if they wanted to attend. This was it. You know, why should I, you know, invest um, in this program or in this short course? You know, what's in it for me kind of thing. So thank you again for that, Terry. So what's your story? That's our tagline, you know, as organizations and leaders, we have to buy into our organization's story. And then we actually have to share it 
with the rest of the organization and get them to buy in the other junior managers, supervisors, individuals, and you also want them to own it or else, you know, the goals that you have at a corporate level, that whole vision, mission, um, what you want to see as success kind of falls down if you're not able to articulate that. And the balance scorecard helps you do that. It forces you to really define you know, what is your objectives, your goals, your, your metrics, and that's the beauty of it. Yeah, so this is our vision and mission. Um, just if we had to do it in a nutshell, it's really to improve the competency and strategic planning in the Caribbean. We know that there are a lot of executives and C-suite members who lead their strat planning sessions, but they may not use a methodology or they may use whatever they've inherited. And so give them an opportunity to be trained in a set or specific methodology. And you can even have the opportunity to be certified, right? Because in the end, with that competence, you can improve your business, the efficiency, the effectiveness, and the success. And I mean, in the end, we're really just looking um, to generate revenue, profit, or even the lives of our stakeholders for those who are in government agencies. So what's S plus and CSS story? Um, we just talked about the tagline. It's a symposium on the first day, a strategic planning course, as well as the symposium. They're both hybrid events. And it's really to inspire organization leaders and senior managers to move off from that whole survival mode, as we said, and giving them that, those strategic insights and tools that they need. So Participants or attendees on both days will learn, you know, practical techniques and tools to take away that they can use. I think uh, September is end of fiscal for most in the region. So you're going straight into October. Some of you guys have already started your strategic, your strategic planning for the new fiscal year. So that might assist some of these tools that you take away. And we'll be using or referring to the nine step framework that Terry covered in his presentation. So we have a whole slew of consultants, authors, trainers, regional practitioners, um, and leaders in strategy and strategic planning joining us. So someone asked about the course, this is it here. Um, it's in person and online. So there's a different course attached. Feel free to go onto the website if you forget or don't get a snapshot of this. You can attend either event one or event two, or you can do both. It's really up to you. If you are someone who's already been certified or exposed and you don't think the course is for you, if you've done it before, maybe the Barnes Forecard Professional, the Barnes Forecard Associate, feel free to check out the conference. Yeah. These are our speakers, our international speakers, Helen from Barnes Forecard Institute and the Strategy Management Group, Howard Brom, the founder and president of the group and BSI, we'll have the CEO of BSI, the vice president, and then Terry, who um, joined us and presented to us today. But then we also will have our red strat table, and we would have persons from the region, uh, local leaders, regional leaders from across the Caribbean who will share what they have been using. Some of them may have used Balance Scorecard or some semblance of it. Um, however, they may be using OKRs, they may be using MBOs. We want to hear from them. You know, I think it's important for us to share in the Caribbean what has been working. Yeah. So that's our lineup. And we also have strategists, persons who are tasked with leading strategic planning in their various organizations. So in terms of summary, three symposium panels for the red strap table, nine to 12 regional industry panelists, industries that they will be coming from, retail, oil and gas, financial conglomerates, fast food government, three to four members per panel, 60 minutes in total. Yeah, and then you can have Q&A so that you can ask questions um, to our panelists as well. They would be sharing real life case studies where they should break through um, using strategy in their organization and where they've seen success and their challenges as well. This is what our agenda looked like. Um, so you'll see your, you can see the cursor, the three 
panels or three red strat tables. And then in between there, we would have our keynote address from Howard, Surviving Ground Zero. We have David with Strategy Management through Accountability. Terry doing what's in your toolbox. Yeah, so again, if you need to get more info, feel free to reach out. The BSC uh, Essentials, so the Bands Cook at Essentials, Terry just went over, so you have nothing to fear, didn't miss anything. But if you want the full course modules, please reach out and we will share. And this is what we close with, no man can walk out on his own story. That's from Rango. I watch a lot of cartoons, as I mentioned in my last webinar, because I have a toddler, so yeah. And I thought this one was it was a really uh, deep one in that uh, you have to own that story, as I was mentioning before, as an individual, as a department head, as a leader, and, and as an organization, and see it through. So register now, limited seats. Um, so don't miss it. We, I can vouch for the Balanced Scorecard Framework. It has worked. I've used it for over 10 years in varying organizations. Somebody had asked me in chat, like, you know, where did we see success? Um, I would have used it at CARICOM, iGov, and government, um, both in private sectors. And it has worked. The thing is, some persons think BSC is old, is archaic, doesn't work. But again, you have to follow that nine step. Uh, framework that Terry was referring to and go through the stages. You can't like half tail it or else, well, of course, it doesn't work, right? And then use your other tools in between, like the Ishikawa, as he said, your logic models to really help you break it out. And, you know, you take the time to flesh things out and to brainstorm. So far in the region, we have trained probably 200 plus in the last year and a half with our biggest group last year, late last year with the answer group training 60 of their top executives C-suite, they had decided to use that methodology and model to execute their strategy, build and execute their strategy throughout their organization. So, I mean, feel free to get more information and see if this is the right fit for your organization. I'm sure it will add some value. All right, so Terry, I don't know if you have any closing words. Uh, just want to thank everybody for attending today. We hope you found it informational. Uh, if you have any more questions, please reach out to Nichelle or you can reach out to me directly at the Institute. Thank you very much. Great. So thanks everyone. See you at the summit, hopefully. <laughs> Bye. Bye everyone.